Hi, welcome to Harvard Art Museums. My name is Cristina Morilla. I'm a paintings conservator at the Strauss Center for Conservation and Technical Studies. And today I'm going to be talking about Rubens. What I would like to do is to follow Rubens' brushstroke through the surface of this wonderful oil sketch, Hercules Strangling the Nemean Lion. I'm going to be talking about technique and about the way Rubens achieved that distinctive style that today we understand as characteristic of his art. But before doing that, let me introduce our painting in context. The oil sketch that you see on the left, Guayas of Cardinal Infante, Ferdinand of Spain, was actually made for the same client that our painting, and that client happened to be the King of Spain, Philip IV, who also became a devout admirer of Rubens. Rubens started to produce his oil sketches very early in his career, around 1600. He was the first artist to use oil paint on wood panels to produce sketches. He was really a pioneer on a new way of expression that merged together painting and drawing. These two sketches were made at the very end of his career when he developed a really distinctive style that we'll see in a minute. The small oil sketches have the purpose of presenting an idea for a larger painting to the client. The scale of the sketch in relation to the final painting is shown here in this example. Unfortunately, the larger version of Hercules strangling the Nemean lion is lost, but we know that it existed and it was hanging once on the walls of the Royal Palace of Madrid. The difference between the oil sketch and the final result was not only established by the size, but also by the technique. The loose brush took almost impressionist that Rubens shows here was really a novelty that a lot of painters will try to imitate later. Hercules and the Nemea Lion is small in size, like so many of other sketches, and is um, is telling us about the episode of the 12 labors imposed upon Hercules, the Roman hero, as a punishment. Hercules accomplished this particular one by choking the animal and then using his skin as clothing. Before our sketch was made, there was a technical and compositional process taking place in Rubens' mind. Rubens study and copy models that were circulating in Italy and in Spain places where he had the opportunity to study the old masters. Rubens, however, did not just follow these models, but instead reinvented them. Um, having them translated to his own personal pictorial language, as these two sketches show. Red chalk on paper seems to be his favorite medium in these cases. All these variations speak about a process that happened during 20 years from the very first sketch on 1620 to the left, going through the 1630 versions and ending on Harvard's oil sketch. The main difference between the sketches on paper and our version is the format that changes from a vertical one to a horizontal one. On Harvard's oil paint, Hercules and the lion spread in space and the clash between the two figures gains in power and movement. Let's see now how he actually painted it. Those streaky areas correspond to the application of ivory color based stone that prepares the ground before the application of the paint. Many of Rubens' sketches show the same fast and wide brush stroke. Then the figures were first drawn using red chalk, echoing the previous sketches. You can see here the remaining red chalk lines that were not covered by the oil paint. Then he outlined the figures. Uh, the uh, figure of Hercules with red ochre doing the same with the lion, but this time using a darker tone. On a third step, he applied the color of the flesh. The cheek of Hercules is the only area of the face that has received this attention, while the rest reveals the exposed ivory tone ground that we were mentioned before. Finally, Rubens will add the highlights. The light tones are thicker and build intentionally the volumes that are closer to the viewer, where the more diluted oil is placed in the areas that recede. 
When painting, Rubens was not only adding oil colors, but also scratching what he already painted to uncover the ground, increasing the texture and idea of movement. Here we can see how he has retrieved the paint, probably with the back of his brush. As you see in this photography with the breaking light, the painting texture ranges from really thick, probably achieved by adding fillers to the paint, to very diluted, even watery painting, achieved by adding a solvent to dilute it, an effect that will leave these beautiful brush marks that we see here in this tiny area. And we actually can see the movement of the brush, how he goes and stops, goes and stops, and is getting gradually thinner to the left. Here we have a different brush stroke, thicker, and in contrast, we have also this watery, even invisible um, brush stroke on the background. More variety of brush strokes here. This time, heavy compact zigzag pattern Follow up by the wider and loose, but it's still thick one. And then here to the right, what Rubens is doing is kind of sculpting what he already painted. So we see that in here, this really uh, wide and still wet brush stroke, he's retrieving the paint with short and sharp um, strokes of the brush. At this level of detail, we can also see a fingerprint on the lower area of the painting that became more evident when photographed with infrared light. So the question here is, is this Rubens' fingerprint? And in my opinion, since he was the only one doing these small sketches for the client, this is the most probable. So far, we have seen what is going on on the surface of the painting, but we can also examine the hidden layers. We took two millimetric samples of paint and prepared them to see under the microscope. This is a vertical cut of the millimetric sample photographed with normal light. So from bottom to top, we see a white layer made out of chalk with really coarse and big particles. And then the painting layer itself with mixed particles of black and ochre because we took the sample from a dark brown area. The pigment here is made out of very fine particles that correspond to a meticulously grinded pigments. If we change the light of the sample to ultraviolet light, we can even see more details like these layers on the top of the painting, which corresponds to several applications of varnish that have been layering up over the centuries. The varnish layers can be seen throughout the whole surface of the painting. The fluorescence of the varnish gives a yellowish and blurry appearance to the surface and can speak both about the nature of the resin applied and its thickness and will serve us when we start the conservation process and especially the cleaning. On this particular detail taken from the right foot of Hercules, we have photographs taken with natural light to the left and ultraviolet light to the right. Ultraviolet photography highlight these uh, darker pigments over here and this area over here. And it indicates that it's a uh, later addition, or in other words, that the brush stroke is not from Rubens' hand. The area has also been clean before, and we can see the disruption of the varnish in this kind of uh, watermarks. A comparison confirms also the quality of this particular area is not the one that we should expect from Rubens either and uh, will be under consideration during the conservation process. What we have seen so far is an impressive uh, range of brush strokes, a careful but still loose way of painting, full of movement. This topic uh, really uh, gave a different meaning to the word sketch. When talking about Rubens, sketch doesn't mean any more unfinished, but rather a color model. And uh, what I would say that he's in switching languages between uh, sketches and finished painting. He's uh, using a different language. And what is even more important, the sketches show a part of the creative process that we cannot see. 
in uh, larger format paintings where the brush stroke gets lost. Um, in another, uh, in, in the words of another great painter of the 19th century, uh, who spoke about Rubens' technique with better words, he said, Rubens was the homer of painting, the father of warmth and enthusiasm in art, not because of his perfection in any one direction, but because of that hidden force, that life and spirit, which he put into everything he did. Thank you very much for joining.